Happy New Year and welcome to this the homily for the feast, the solemnity of the Mother of God, the 1st of January. Let's look at the Gospel text first and then some wider comments because uh, this is a, a solemnity where so much more is going on uh, than meets the eye. We have the shepherds who have just been told by the angels of all the glory that is to be found in the fulfilling of a sign in uh, uh, the house of David in Bethlehem. So remember the glory of the sign. What was the sign? Well, the sign was the one that Isaiah uh, had initially tried to give to King Ahaz. Ask a sign of the mother of your God. In most of our translations it says, ask a sign of the Lord your God. But the text in Qumran says, ask a sign of the mother of your God, suggesting that the original Hebrew referred still back to the time when the uh, royal queen was considered to be linked to the mother goddess, before all that was expelled from the temple uh, in Josiah's time. And it was promised to be coming back. The fulfillment of all that, of all the things that had been expelled, was going to come back, but in an entirely surprising new way. So this is part of what the angels had told the shepherds. Remember, those untrustworthy ones, those uh, people who lived in shame rather than in glory, those powerless ones, and that they, they were to go to the place where this was to happen, which would turn out not to be the place that King David thought it would happen, the, the temple, the holy place that Solomon would set up, but in his own house, the house of David in Bethlehem, and that the sign would be fulfilled in a manger, manger being a pun on the word, with the word Jerusalem, but obviously a very lowly form of Jerusalem. So, all that is part of what is in the background to what the shepherds have just heard. So they went with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. So what looks like simply, you know, a photo shoot of something that was there is in fact already in their minds. Uh, the fulfillment in a completely bizarre way of the most grandiose prophecies of old. They have come to see the real mother of God, the mother of the Lord, because the firstborn has in fact been born in the manger rather than in the holy place in Jerusalem. But that is the reality of all, if you like, the, uh, the drama, the liturgical drama of temples and all that. The reality that was born is this maiden, this virgin, who has given birth to the firstborn son and laid him in a manger. The mother of God has made it possible for the Lord to come into the world. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. In other words, the shepherds were telling the bystanders very much what I'm telling you. <laughs> That's hence the amazement. The, uh, they were saying, listen, you, you think that this is just someone giving birth in a stable. Ha, 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 little do you know. What's really going on here is that the mother of God has given birth to the firstborn, the Lord. This is the promised sign. This is the beginning of the fulfillment of creation. That's what we've seen with all the angels giving glory, because the angels giving glory is the sign that creation is being fulfilled. Something vastly richer than what seems to be going on is available here. And amongst all the people who were amazed, well, there was Mary herself, the mother of God. She'd been tipped off that she was about to be the portal, the, the holy place, that she was to be the uh, Ark of the Covenant, bearing the covenant inside her. Gabriel had told her that. Elizabeth had confirmed it, and John the Baptist had done his little belly dance to, uh, 
to, to make the point. And here Mary treasures all these words and ponders them in her heart. So here we have the mother of God, who is also the incarnation of wisdom, the first incarnation of wisdom. But what is interesting is that this is now interactional. The incarnation, the coming into the world of the Lord, is interactional. There is interaction going to go on now for the whole of her life between her and her son, and then with all the brothers whom her son will bring into her life, all the brothers and sisters. Because that's what this is about. She is about to become the mother of us all, the mother of all of us who have been born into the new world of becoming sons and daughters of the Most High. That's the purpose of our uh, Galatians reading. When the appointed time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born a subject of the law, to redeem the subjects of the law. So that was the first understanding, to redeem the subjects of the law, so that they no longer needed to sacrifice sheep instead of their firstborn, because he was going to make the redemption for them, to enable us to be adopted as sons. That was why we are sent the Holy Spirit after after his death, he was able to give us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit meaning that we are now on the inside. We are part of that incarnational stretching out that came into being because of the Virgin's yes. The Spirit that cries, Abba, Father. And it is this that makes you a son or daughter of God. You're not a slave anymore. You're no longer part of bowed down creation, creation that doesn't know where it's going, creation in which you're blind to its purposes. No. The Holy Virgin giving birth to her son and thus enabling us in principle already to start being considered sons and daughters of the Most High and therefore heirs on the inside of the fullness of creation. This is part of what the shepherds would have been sharing with uh, the bystanders and with Virgin, who's thinking about this himself. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. In other words, they are able to rejoice with the same joy that the angels were rejoicing. They've already begun to see the beginning of the fulfillment of creation. They, from the place, as I say, of shame and uh, contempt which they occupied. And the uh, Old Testament reading, which we're given today, brings out something similar and special about this. It's the ironic blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord uncover his face to you and bring you peace. What was it that the shepherds came to? The shepherds came and saw for the first time the completely authentic, ironic blessing because they saw the face. What was... The babe was wrapped in swaddling clothes, presumably not the babe's face. They came and they gazed upon the face of the Lord. The Lord's face smiling upon them was the blessing of the Most High. The ironic, ironic blessing had been a, a prophetic blessing. And here at last, in this place of bizarre fulfilment, the real thing had come upon them. And we are invited into being ones who will receive that blessing upon whom the face of the Lord, shown to us through the Holy Spirit, will shine upon us and make us shine as well. This is part of the mystery of the interaction of the Incarnation, in which the wisdom that is creating and opening up the world to creation is kept alive, and we are invited into a new, safe projecting, opening up family in which we will be insiders in the opening up of creation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.